Welcome to Heritage Events Live, a post-election analysis. What lies ahead for America? We're thrilled to have you here. Here are some tips for making the most of your virtual experience with us. Please submit questions through the questions tab. Feel free to share your name and affiliation. We love to know who's joining us. If there are any minor technical issues, we ask for your patience, as many of us are working from home and using home internet. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to the Mies Center's look at what lies ahead for America and our constitution after the 2020 elections. I'm Kay James, president of the Heritage Foundation. As we know, our constitution has been under blistering attacks lately. We've seen the New York Times 1619 project attempt to declare that America was founded for the purpose of slavery and that our founding documents even codified it. We've seen politicians and the media on the left try to convince the American people to abolish the Electoral College, effectively turning over elections to be decided by those on the West and Northeast coast. We've watched as radical Marxist students, faculty and administrators have trashed the right of free speech on college campuses, equating speech that offends someone with violence. Yet at the same time, we've watched the media portray real violence, like some of the riots plaguing American cities as simply peaceful exercises of the First Amendment. We've had presidential candidates talk about sending armed police officers door to door to confiscate our guns after they pledged to gut the Second Amendment. And during the COVID crisis, we've had governors who are blatantly ignorant of the role of federalism and of the states during a national pandemic, while at the same time exerting police powers well beyond their authority. As we meet today, we have a contested election and actually don't know who will be our next president. Even if President Trump wins re-election, we still can't let our guard down regarding the Constitution and the courts. There will still be large elements within this country who will work constantly to undermine our constitutional order. If Vice President Biden wins, the left will only be emboldened to step up its assault on our republic. In addition, if we have a President Biden and the Senate flips over to the Democrats, the filibuster will be lost and we'll have a rubber stamp for tax hikes, single pay, health care, and the Green New Deal. And perhaps the single most dangerous part of that scenario is the packing of the Supreme Court which would destroy the integrity of the court and turn it into a political body that it was never meant to be. Whoever wins, the Heritage Foundation will continue to provide a needed education to the American people on how nothing is more critical to preserving their cherished rights than the US Constitution. And regardless of the outcome of the presidential election, there's a hopeful development we saw come out of the election, just the opposite of what the media and the pollsters predicted. The American people helped conservatives gain seats in the House of Representatives, sending a stinging rebuke to the far left's radical agenda. Over the past few years, we've started breaking through and convincing non-traditional audiences that conservative solutions are effective solutions that can help their families and communities. It's a critical long-term strategy that we at Heritage have been focused on and will continue to focus on, and it's great to see it bearing some fruit. Well, I'm excited about our discussion today, and I'd like to thank our outstanding panelists who are taking the time to share their thoughts and their expertise with us. Jim Gary of National Review, Byron York from the Washington Examiner, my old and dear friend, former US Secretary of Education and former drug czar, Bill Bennett, and John Yu from UC Berkeley School of Law. All of them I admire and respect gratefully, and I, like you, am looking forward to this panel this afternoon. 
Now, I'd like to turn things over to John Malcolm, who will give you a fuller introduction of our guests and moderate this fascinating discussion. John, while he is a close personal friend, is also Vice President of Heritage's Institute for Constitutional Government and the Director of our Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Between his recent work helping lead our push for Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation and his oversight of Heritage's Election Integrity Project, John has been one of the busiest folks in Washington and one of the most <laughs> well-respected. So John, turning it over to you. Well, thank you, Mrs. James. I very much uh, appreciate those uh, those kind words. Uh, let me invite our four our four panelists to to join me now. Uh, because we have a lot to cover, they are going to not get the introductions that each one deserves. I will make them very brief so we have more time uh, for our discussion. Uh, so joining us today is Jim Garrity. He's a senior political correspondent for National Review. Uh, he's the author of three books. Uh, one is called Heavy Lifting with Cam Edwards, The Weed Agency, which was a novel and a Washington Post bestseller, and Voting to Kill. Uh, he's a former recipient of CPAC's Journalist of the Year and the Young Conservatives Coalition's William F. Buckley Award. We're also joined by Byron York. Byron is the chief political correspondent for the Washington Examiner and a Fox News contributor. He previously worked as the White House correspondent for the National Review, and he's the author of, and this has got to be one of my favorite titles, The Vast Left-Wing Conspiracy, the untold story of how democratic operatives, eccentric billionaires, and liberal activists and assorted celebrities tried to bring down a president and why they'll try even harder next time. We're also joined by Dr. Bill Bennett. As, uh, as Mrs. James just said, he has held not one, but two cabinet positions. Uh, he was the Secretary of Education under President Reagan, and he was the nation's first drug czar under President George H.W. Bush. Uh, he's the author of 25 books, including two New York Times bestseller, uh, bestsellers. His book, The Book of Virtues, was one of the most popular books in the 1990s, and he is the host of two popular syndicated programs, The Bill Bennett Podcast, and the Bill Bennett interview. And finally, we have Professor John Yu. John is the Emanuel S. Heller Professor of Law at, Berkeley, at the Berkeley School of Law. He's a former law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas, a former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, and he's the author of several books, including his latest, Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's Fight for Presidential Power. Gentlemen, welcome. So here we are two days after the election, and the winner is well, we don't know yet. <laughs> They're still counting in Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. There's most likely going to be a recount in Wisconsin. There have been lawsuits that have been filed in Georgia, Nevada, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, with possibly more to come. What can we expect in the days ahead? And what are the prospects of one of these cases potentially reaching the Supreme Court? Uh, jump ball, who would like to uh, to jump in? Well, I'll, I'll start off. Um... First of all, uh, Trump needs to win some states. Uh, Georgia and North Carolina are not in the bag at all. Uh, Pennsylvania is iffy, uh, but he has to win all of those. And even if he does, he then has to win an additional state, Arizona, maybe even Nevada. Um, look, these the, the possibility of all that happening uh, does not seem terribly good, even if uh, they show a, some irregularities in some places. Um, it seems to me what the Trump people need to do, and do it soon, uh, is come up with some sort of presentation, a bill of particulars, accusations of specific irregularities they believe have taken place uh, in key voting areas. Uh, if you listen to Scott Walker, the former uh, governor of Wisconsin, Republican, uh, talking this morning about recounts. He said, look, we, we've had a number of statewide recounts in Wisconsin, and they changed the vote total by 150, 250, 300 votes. Uh, not enough to, to make a big difference. Uh, so th the president has an uphill uh, fight in this. He certainly has a, just intense support out there, just absolutely intense support. Um, so he's gonna have an audience. Uh, but whether he's actually going to prevail in any of these places does not look terribly good right now. Anyone else want to jump in? Uh, I could talk a little bit about the law. And uh, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation and, and you, John, for putting this panel together. It's great to 
see you with other people other than just doing our one-on-one -on -one podcast. And I mm -hmm. want to uh, praise you for your prescience because I don't know why I was on this panel a month ago or two months ago when you originally scheduled it, but you were like, hey, maybe we should have a guy talk about what Let's might happen to the Supreme Court. <laughs> so it's all your fault for triggering this because um, I didn't know what I was going to say uh, if it had been a normal election. Uh, but being a veteran of Florida 2000, I could. Uh, it looks to me like you could make this year Pennsylvania 2020, if the uh, things line up for Trump the way uh, Byron just described. Uh, you know, Trump keeps Georgia, North Carolina, and then he wins either Nevada or Arizona. Then it all comes down to Pennsylvania. And I, I agree with Byron. I think the campaign needs to do a better job of setting out the bill of particulars, but they don't have to write it up. De novo, as we say in the law, because all they got to do is cut and paste out of Justice Alito's opinions and just issue them as a press release. Because Justice Alito has been urging the Supreme Court with three other justices to take a case out of Pennsylvania to strike down this three day extension of when ballots can be received. Now, I don't know if the court will do that if it doesn't matter. If those ballots that come in in that three day period, don't change the outcome, then I could easily see them not taking it. But if they do make all the difference, then Justice Alito says in his opinions, the constitution gives state legislatures alone the power to set the rules for the time, place and manner of elections and to ultimately pick the presidential electors. And that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court by changing that deadline by three days and also monkeying around with other things like signatures that are used to verify the ballots and so on, Justice Alito clearly said, I think that the Pennsylvania courts have violated the federal constitution is an important national issue and the Supreme Court should take it. Jim, Bill, wanna weigh in? Sure, I mean, you know, by the way, keeping in mind, in a lot of states, it was fairly common to say, as long as your ballot was postmarked by election day, uh, it should be counted and it's fine. Uh, Pennsylvania really kind of stretched things by saying you didn't need the postmark or it's okay if the postmark is smudged or uh, hard to read, and that really puts it into a grayer area. I had a smart Republican consultant put it to me. He's like, his, he made the argument that by the time the polls close, in most places like 8 p.m. on election night, you want to know exactly how many ballots there are to be out, that are exist in the voter universe. You don't necessarily need to know who won, but you want to know exactly if there's supposed to be 1,323,470. Well, if you add up all the votes when you're done and there are more, well, then you know somebody got double counted. If you add up all of them and they're low, then you're like, okay, either some people left their ballot blank or the, the count is too low. But if you have some amount of ballots that could be entering after election day, well, then you don't know what that final threshold is. You don't know what it's supposed to be yet. And that was his point, like that's how you get into these sorts of, of situations where people start saying, hmm, is there some mischief going on? Now, one other thing we should not know, since the pandemic hit and it became clear that a lot of people were gonna be voting early, voting absentee, it's been pretty clear Democrats were much more interested in voting early and voting absentee. And Republicans were much more interested in voting on election day. In most of these states, they started with the election day totals. So, you, you know, unsurprisingly, you get there, boom, there's this nice big lead for Donald Trump. As they, then they go back and they start counting the absentee votes and you start seeing the Biden votes creep up. This by itself is not in, in evidence of shenanigans. This in and of itself is not evidence that something uh, illegal or fraudulent or bad is going on. Um, the only other thing I would add, and we'll talk more about specific states here, Pennsylvania, look, it does not help when the state attorney general, state's chief law enforcement officer, Josh Shapiro, the guy who's supposed to be relatively trusted by everybody, tweets out three days before the election, if all the votes are counted, Joe Biden will win the presidency. Dude, you are the state attorney general. If you want to be state chairman of the state Democratic Party, go for that job. Don't try to be in a law enforcement position and then play partisan cheerleader right before election day. I, you know, it, it's one of those things like, Joe Biden may win the state of Pennsylvania fair and square, but Josh Shapiro going out and being an idiot made sure that everybody, every Republican in the state's gonna say, I don't trust it. This ends up going with any involvement of law enforcement, any involvement of the state officials, people are gonna have suspicion because of the sorts of things that Shapiro said. Yeah, everybody's on guard, that's for sure. Well, this is obviously a very, very strange election, but we do know a few things. Uh, so on a positive note for conservatives, you know, there was no blue tsunami, uh, which a lot of people had predicted. The Republicans have gained seats uh, in the House, and although there are still some outstanding races, uh, they have a very decent chance, not a guarantee, but a very decent chance of keeping their majority uh, in, in the Senate. 
Uh, on the other hand, that majority will, will surely have uh, narrowed. And there is a distinct possibility, if not a likelihood, as you pointed out, that Joe Biden is going to you know, be the next president. So what are your overall reactions to what it is we, are, we have just witnessed? Can I say something on the last point, sure. John, if I may, Bill Bennett? Um, John, you wondered why he was asked. Now he knows why. John, you was always an asset to any discussion. Any of us who know him know that. Presidents know that. Um, I'm a philosopher and wondered why you'd want a philosopher with these guys who follow politics so closely. So let me give you this profound philosophical insight, which is why I am very upset and distressed about the current situation. I'm not given to hysteria or I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Picking up on what Jim was saying, it was Nate Silver, not exactly a Trump guy, who reported Wednesday that Tuesday night there was a tranche of votes from Philadelphia 22,370, I believe, all for Joe Biden. Pause. All for Joe Biden? All for Joe Biden? The numbers, preliminary numbers we see are that 18% of black men voted for Donald Trump. But really, 22,370, this thing is, I'll yield to John Yu, prima facie, self-evident, speaks for itself. There's, there's a real problem here, and it's not 120 or 130, like uh, Scott Walker's citation, other people have been citing the small numbers, and, and Byron's quite, quite right to do it. I think we have grand theft on a massive scale. Anyone else? Well, I think that uh, uh, Secretary Bent makes a, the, an excellent point, and even before you get to the question of the changing the deadlines, you still have to make sure that the votes are counted correctly, and of course, the Trump campaign has filed a series of lawsuits about this. Um, this is my home state, Pennsylvania. But, you know, being from Pennsylvania, our number one uh, our favorite occupation is to dump on our own state and bemoan the people we send to public office and then keep sending them there. But I think we're all going to be familiar with this very soon. Wawa, because that is where everyone's going to be spending their free time in Pennsylvania for the next <laughs> few weeks. And the reason why is because of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, the absentee ballots. Four years ago, I think I looked this up, there were only 84,000 absentee ballots cast in Pennsylvania. It used to be a state where you had to give a reason to not vote in person. This last primary, they had a million and a half absentee ballots. It's just going to be, I think you see the process of bringing them in, counting them is chaotic, and there's going to be potential for abuse and fraud. And of course, this is a hard thing to do is to get the courts to oversee and look at how that's done. The last time we did it was 20 years ago in Florida. And in fact, the Florida courts went nuts with it and it took the US Supreme Court to intervene uh, to stop it so that the state could get its electoral votes in on time. So the thing that Bill's talking about, I think you're gonna see a lot of stories like that popping up and we don't have a, a very good system in place to handle it because of the massive numbers of mail-in ballots that occurred this year. Well, but what about the fact that the Republicans clearly did better in the House and in the Senate uh, than, than people were, were expecting? Were anything about any of these Senate races, for instance, surprising uh, to any of you? Uh, I'll jump in and say, yeah, yeah. I, I went into this thinking that this was going to be a pretty darn lousy night for, uh, for Republicans. I, I didn't think Trump had much of a chance of re-election. Uh, but each one of these swing states, he could win, but that he wasn't going to pull it inside straight. And you know, let's let's keep in mind the context of this election. There's this pandemic going on that has killed roughly 230,000 Americans. Uh, obviously, you know, the the uh, not ideal circumstances for an incumbent president. The pandemic wiped out what had been three years of good economic growth and put the country you know, skyrocketing unemployment. We've been climbing back since the spring, uh, but you know, not where we were before the pandemic, and not the sort of circumstance an incumbent would want. Donald Trump has always been a polarizing guy. He won by the skin of his teeth in just, just enough votes in just enough places in 2016. Um, and let's be honest, this is not the most disciplined man at focusing on what his second term agenda was gonna be. It was, you know, hey, look what, look what Joe Scarborough said today. Let me, let me get angry about what I saw on cable news this morning. Um, you put all that together and the guy almost won anyway. Uh, and we still don't know how it's gonna shake out. He won. Florida and Ohio, almost all the states he needed to get, Florida and Ohio and Iowa. Um, I think he's got North Carolina. I think you look at the total number of, pop, of absentee ballots that are waiting to come back. You know, Biden's got to win something like 83% of them uh, to overtake Trump's lead. So I think North Carolina is almost in the bag. Um, Georgia, you know, all these other states, Wisconsin, Nevada, Georgia, Pennsylvania, 
they're all going to come down to like 1%, 2%. You know, Michigan is probably going to be 3%. He, you know, by, by almost every measure, he should have lost by a ton, and he didn't. So what does that tell you? One, it shows that his appeal uh, is broader than it was. Uh, polling was completely off, and we can talk more about that in a, probably in a few minutes. Um, and just generally, there's this, you know, you already were starting to see it on election night, particularly once Florida, you saw these huge numbers amongst Cuban Americans, Venezuelan Americans, uh, Nicaraguan Americans, and Colombian Americans, all countries that have experienced with socialism. Yeah. Uh, and, you, know, you notice that they did not send Bernie Sanders to go campaign in Little Havana for, for votes for, for Joe Biden there. Uh, it's almost like there's a pattern that, you know, people who have experienced with socialism don't like it and don't want more of it. Uh, but anyway, you add that all up. You, by the way, I think Trump's campaigning to, you know, all across the country probably helps some. Um, Republicans at this point look like they're reasonably safe for 50 Senate votes, and we'll see how things go in Georgia. And not only do they gain seats in the House, I'm going to be very tentative about this. Right now in Politico, they say that Republicans have about 190 seats, and if you look at who leads in the remaining well, in the remaining races, Republicans lead in 25 of them. Now, as more absentees come back, as more uh, uh, early votes get counted, that may not stay that high. But I can do math. 190 plus 25 gives you 215 uh, House seats. And you only need 218 to control the chamber. So chances are Republicans are going to be set just below what they need for a majority, which is a nice spot to be in if you think you're going to do well in the 2022 midterm. So all in all, for Republicans, this, this could have gone a lot worse. This was really not that bad. Um, and if you think Joe Biden is the kind of guy and not controlling with, with the Republicans controlling the Senate, Biden's not going to be able to do court packing or the Green New Deal or, or any of this horrible stuff. It, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and the rest of the hard left of the Democratic Party could be in for a very disappointing two years, even though they, the party controls the White House. You know, on the reason for the Trump's uh, success, or at least doing as well as he did. I spent the last week or eight or nine days of the election in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and even having followed Trump a lot uh, and Trump supporters, I was still uh, surprised at the sheer intensity of the support for President Trump. Uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of it had not really gotten through in some major media outlets. I go there, and the first day I'm there, uh, they're having uh, a big car rally. Uh, and it was a really big car rally. It started in Ohio, went to Wheeling, West Virginia, and then went to Washington, Pennsylvania, which is south of Pittsburgh. And uh, we're talking about 2,000 cars, each with a number of people in them. It was absolutely huge on I-70 and all the Trump flags and everything. Um, and the support for the president there was, and this was all organic. They had organized it themselves, all on Facebook, by the way, uh, and had put all this together themselves without the help of the Trump campaign uh, and without the help of the Republican Party, without anybody's help. Um, and they all had uh, entirely rational reasons uh, for supporting Trump. In that area, oil and gas is such a huge industry. And uh, many, many, many people I talked to had some connection to the oil and gas uh, industry. And, and my favorite one who's, who answered my question said, yes, I am connected to the oil and gas industry. I have electricity and gas in my house. <laughs> um, point being that we all are connected to it. And, um, and it's better and than we have in California, by the way. That's true. There you go. That's true. The, the point, was, yeah. the point was Obama had, and Biden had spent two terms trying to kill them, and Trump didn't. He stopped trying to kill them and encouraged them. So th there were a lot of perfectly rational, reasonable reasons that so many Americans supported Trump is because uh, look at the, are you better off than you were four years ago? The, the, the answers to those questions were very good in the last few days uh, and weeks of the campaign. There was a lot of solid, solid support for him out there. So actually, we've been discussing about whether or not the Republicans are going to keep the majority or not. And if you assume that, that, that Senator Tillis is going to win and Senator Sullivan is going to win, that gets him to 50. So we'll still have the two Georgia races outstanding. But I think it's, it's worth pointing out for the, the people who are listening that even getting to 50 is significant. So even if, you, if the Republicans lost those two Georgia races and they were at 50, 
it is true they would not control the Senate. It would be evenly split. And it is true that the, the Democrats would be able to pass legislation if they stayed together and it was 50-50 and then Vice President Harris would, would break the tie. But they need 51 to exercise the nuclear option uh, on the legislative filibuster. Uh, and without doing, without being able to nuke the legislative filibuster, then things like court packing and whatnot uh, are off the table. So uh, even getting to 50 is significant, although as we say, it's, it's likely that the Republicans will be able to do better than that, get to 51 or, or, or 52. So in, in another thing to observe, regardless of who wins, wins the race, the presidential race, is that to, to the, the surprise of many, uh, the president, President Trump made gains among, among white women, he made uh, gains among Jewish voters, he made gains among Hispanics, African Americans, and the LGBTQ uh, uh, voters. You know, these are some significant demographic shifts. What do you, what do you make of all of that? I make of that that he's popular uh, and that uh, a lot of people like him. This was not a repudiation. Mm -hmm. Uh, of Donald Trump. This election was not a repudiation of Donald Trump. Right. As I read it, and there are experts here, Byron and Jim, certainly, uh, more than I, uh, uh, that was one in the middle. I, th I think it was the moderates who had gone for Trump last time, who went pretty strongly, I think by 14% this time, uh, for, uh, for for Biden. But, um, you know, a lot of people like Donald Trump, and, and a lot of people were surprised by many of the people who do, as you cited, John. The other thing I'd point out uh, and, I, and I think this is this represents a realignment of the parties or a potential realignment of the parties is is that the Democrats are the big money uh, party in this uh, in this race. The numbers I have, again, I ready to be corrected by people close to the ground. I, I read Democrats spent seven billion dollars. Republicans spent three point eight billion dollars. Heck, one hundred million dollars against Lindsey Graham in South Carolina failed in a trash can. 70 million against Susan Collins in Maine. She won handily. Um, sorry, Mike Bloomberg. I guess he probably won't even notice 100 million gone, but it's gone, you know, in Florida to beat uh, to beat Trump. And all the money to turn the Senate um, uh, failed. The thing I'm happiest about is I think leftism failed, socialism failed. More people self-identified as conservatives in 2020 and in 2016, that's another thing I think worth noting. Anyone else want to weigh in on what Bill just said, or about some of these demographic, you know, demographic shifts that we saw? How, you know, how are the Republicans going to capitalize on that, Jim? Sure. I just want to just add regarding um, that South Carolina Senate race. Uh, Jamie Harrison. Every, at least, seems like every two years, at least, we get one great Southern Democratic hope, and we are told that the Democrats are coming back in the South and that this isn't your father's Democratic Party, and they're competitive. Well, it turns out, if you pronounce the name Jamie Harrison with a low country drawl, it actually sounds like Beta O'Rourke. That's, that's, it turns out there's kind of an accent there. Um, but yeah, so Beta O'Rourke had been the king of the hype of, oh, the Democrats are coming back. Uh, we all remember that he got more, uh, he had broken, blown away the record for donations in a Senate race back in 2018. That record was blown away this year by Jamie Harrison. Both of them lost. Um, what happened in both of these races is you have somebody who you have candidates that are fairly cookie cutter, you know, they're certainly far too left for their red Republican leaning state. Um, and we heard quite a bit this cycle about how Texas was a swing state and lots of folks put it in the toss up pile. And among the person who was saying the most that Biden needs to go to Texas and Biden needs to campaign and Biden can win there was Beto O'Rourke, who apparently plans on running for governor in two years. Well, once it turns out Beto O'Rourke is as accurate in assessing the presidential race in Texas as he was in the Senate race in Texas. And what you saw in these particular cases, and we can probably throw in Amy McGrath in the Kentucky Senate race up against Mitch McConnell, at least every two years, there's at least one Democratic candidate who's running against a Republican incumbent in a reddish, you know, Republican state and they convince themselves, Democrats all across the country say, this is the year we can get them. Ooh, we hate Mitch McConnell. Ooh, I can't stand Ted Cruz. Um, oh, Lindsey Graham, you know, and they throw in tons of money. My parents live in South Carolina. Every commercial break was Jamie Harris over and over again. If it wasn't the Harris campaign, it was one of these Democratic outside groups. Last I checked, you lost by 14. Not all that close. Really, in the end, wasn't, you know, I mean, maybe by South Carolina standard, that's a little better than usual. Um, 
So this kind of ties into our question about the polling. You know, why did the you know why did the Democrats not see Tom, uh, uh, Donald Trump doing better amongst various Latinos, particularly in Florida? Why did they not see Trump still doing pretty well amongst white women? Uh, improvement amongst African American men, improvements amongst gays and lesbians. Well, they're in a bubble, and everybody they talk to is in the Acela corridor in California. I exaggerate slightly, but I think you get the gist. That you know they don't talk to white women who like President Trump. They don't talk to African American men who like President Trump. Uh, they don't talk to Latino. Like they, they, you can almost immediately see as soon as the Florida returns were coming in. Some folks were openly saying, "Well, Cuban Americans, you know how they are. They're weird. They're always Republican leaning." No, no, no. Back in 2012, uh, Romney carried the Cuban American vote in Florida by only 50% to 47%. The thinking was that Cuban Americans were going to be like the rest of the Latino community and gravitate towards the Democratic Party. And then along comes Bernie Sanders. Socialism. We're going to be all socialists. And lo and behold, all these people who have lived under socialism, or their parents did, or their grandparents did, look at this and say, whoa, we don't want any of that. We came to this country because it's the land of opportunity. We have no problem with uh, with capitalism. And, you know, lo and behold, this is why, and, and this is how Florida, which is allegedly a swing state. By the way, I don't think it's a swing state. I think it's, it's basically Republican leading. I think so many people have post-traumatic flashbacks to the Florida recount that they've convinced themselves that it's this perfect 50-50 balance where it could come down to a couple hundred votes. Look, most of the time, Florida's had at least one Republican senator. It's we had a Republican governor for the whole bunch of, for about a couple of decades now. Most of this, the House delegation has been Republican. Republicans have controlled the state legislature for the better part of a generation. Guess what, folks? Florida's a Republican state. I do I, think I, Georgia's I, in play. I, yeah, go ahead. I do think that Jim, that, that I wouldn't. You know, Georgia has John Ossoff and 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 Warnock. I didn't happen in South Carolina and probably won't happen in North Carolina, but, but Georgia is maybe a different story. John, go ahead. I, I'm I'm uh, really scared because it sounds like Garrity's been listening to the conversations that I had as a kid growing up asking, why do we like Ry Ronald Reagan so much? Because he hates communism. <laughs> and as a, yeah, as an immigrant to the United States myself, I, that's, that what, that's what made me a Republican was we don't want to be socialists. I, I mean, I, I think Jim's completely right about that. Although I don't think an Irish guy could do too well eating Korean food at my dining table. But other than that, <laughs> I think he would have fit right in. Let's we'll say, I got a pretty strong spot. Let me just make two other, uh, just two other observations on why maybe minorities broke better for uh, Trump. And I think it's going to continue in the right hands. Uh, look at what happened out in California. There was a ballot initiative out here in right the, yeah. probably the most diverse state in yeah. the country. Yeah. There's no yeah. race that's in the majority here right now to overrule Prop 209, to yeah. let the state yeah. government and the university start using race again in admissions and in government contracts. It lost, not just because it lost resoundingly. I think it might've lost by the a measure that was greater than the margin to put Prop 209 in place in the first place, I think so. which is in incredible. But so I think maybe my point is that I think if uh, the Republican party comes back to its true principles, being the colorblind party, you know, putting aside all the critical race stuff we keep hearing about. And that Trump, in his way, made very clear that distinction between the Democratic and Republican Party, and then explaining to uh, minority groups why those fundamental Republican principles benefit them. I think it works. I think you saw it work out here. So I think it's not just things like, um, you, know, you know, using people's skin color to decide where they get into college or not, but I think that really resonates with Asians, but also deregulation, the open economy, uh, right, the enormous gains that uh, Jim mentioned in the economy, I think clearly resonated here with uh, Hispanics and Blacks. And then the last thing I would say that hadn't been mentioned, I'm not sure whether how much this affected it though, was uh, making a stand on law and order, restoring security into the cities. It's, I mean, I'm struck often by watching the protests and seeing how much it's a upper class phenomenon. <laughs> Those are the people out, you know, leading these protests and it's, they're trashing the neighborhoods of lower income minority families and maybe Trump's demand for a restoration of law and order in the cities resonated with them too. Again, these are not policies aimed at any kind of, uh, any racial group, it's just restoring basic colorblind principles that have been long Republican principles and just explaining why they benefit minority groups. I, I guess we should add that although it doesn't look as if he prevailed, that John James came very, very close to picking off Gary Peters uh, in Michigan. And, and then in terms of, of changing demographics of people who were elected, 
Uh, so Republicans have added at least 13 uh, new women members to the House of Representatives. Six of them actually picked off and flipped uh, key demo, you know, Democratic seats. And so, you know, what what can we anticipate uh, from this new, you know, powerful group of uh, of women, con uh, you know, congressional representatives? Well, you know, I'm I'm almost reminded um, there was an impeachment uh, earlier uh, this year. And back in 1998 and 99, when uh, Republicans uh, impeached Bill Clinton, in the 98 midterms, Newt Gingrich thought they were going to pick up a lot of seats. They thought there was going to be a winner for them. Um, and uh, in fact, they didn't. They kept control, but it was pretty narrow. Um, and it, it just didn't work out. And you, you almost get the sense that the public, uh, that Nancy Pelosi has found out that maybe the public doesn't love uh, the House Democratic uh, agenda as much as um, she thinks they do, or she thinks they should. Um, but I, th you know, I think what we're going to see in general, um, uh, if the president loses, um, is that you know a, a lot of people in the resistance and in the ranks of never Trump Trumpers uh, would like to see what they call Trumpism just be totally destroyed. They wanted to see Donald Trump lose in a landslide, be completely repudiated. Uh, by the voters. They wanted to see Republicans lose in the Senate. They talked about burning the Republican Party to the ground. Uh, and they're very disappointed. I'm not sure how, they, how they're going to react right now. They're, they're not sure themselves, I think. Uh, but I think what's pretty clear is that uh, the president's agenda uh, is going to live uh, in the hearts uh, and the uh, proposals of Republicans for quite a long time. On the presidential front, you'll I think clearly see, uh, and you would see this even if, Pres if Trump is reelected, uh, you'll see a number of younger Republicans try to create um, a, a, a Trump style appeal while smoothing down some of the rougher edges of Donald Trump that are just his, they're all yeah. his anyway, right. Uh, right. he is what he is. And, um, but they're going to model themselves on this and I think you'll see the same sort of thing in the House. I mean, if you're leading uh, Republicans in the House right now, and especially if Jim is correct, and it turns out to be a very, very narrow uh, Democratic margin of control, um, I think you're going to see a very, very Trumpy bunch of lawmakers. That's certainly the lesson that Kevin McCarthy is going to take from it. Well, so somebody who clearly had a very bad night on Tuesday was, uh, was Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she had boasted that she was going to expand her majority. The Democrats really failed to pick off, uh, as far as I know, a single House Republican who was running for re-election. And she's, you know, they suffered uh, some losses in what had been previously considered safe seats. Uh, so one, you know, how is this going to affect, uh, you know, the, the, the quote unquote, the squad all won. So they're all still there and, and probably added to their ranks, actually. Uh, so how is this going to affect the Democrats? Uh, agenda and and do you think that you might get a leadership uh, uh, challenge? Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll say briefly from ignorance, and then we'll let Jim speak from from knowledge. I would hope there'd be a challenge from the squad. Um, Nancy Pelosi versus uh, AOC. This is what we call in philosophy a case of insufficient options. But uh, <laughs> those insufficient, thank you, John. Those insufficient options are such that uh, I will regale in this. I will rejoice in this. The American people will watch these two extremely unendearing people uh, go at uh, go go at each other. Um, I kind of hope Pelosi stays, but I hope there's a big fight with somebody like AOC for the uh, for the leadership. That would be a good thing. By the way, John, can I ask you a question, John Malcolm? Sure. I didn't realize that, but you you remind us if there's a 50-50 split. Uh, they can't end the filibuster. And you said right. that means they couldn't do the court packing. That means they couldn't, uh, with the filibuster, probably make Puerto Rico and D.C. states uh, and probably couldn't do some of these other things. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly okay. correct. Good, good to know. I feel better now. Jim? <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Jim? <laughs> yeah, I, on that one, we can quote Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Um, you don't have the votes, you need congressional approval, and you, actually, wait, I'm sorry, it's the musical Hamilton. They themselves did not actually say that, but uh, principle still applies. 
Um, looking back, it's a little strange that both the Democrats and the media, and some people might say I'm repeating myself, uh, walked into this election thinking that the Democrats' House majority was going to expand, uh, not just for, you know, overconfidence reasons, but because in 2018, they picked most of the low-hanging fruit, that if you were a, a Republican who was hanging on by the skin of his teeth, if you know, if 2018 was this wave that washed you out, anybody who survived 2018 was probably going to be okay. A, a Republican who survived 2018 was probably going to be okay with Trump at the top of the ticket and driving up Republican turnout. So far, that seems to be the case. Um, by the way, regarding the squad, and you say, yes, they all got reelected, all of them pretty much are, are really Democratic districts. Maybe right. Rashida Tlaib in Michigan is, is semi-competitive. If you look at it the right way and, and the right set of circumstances. But so they're going to be in our lives for better or for worse for a pretty long time. Um, that having Good. been said, there's always been some really leftward members of the House. You know, uh, Dennis Kucinich, probably some people, you know, like that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have a great deal of influence. They'll probably get a lot of cable news time. They will still be celebrity House members. But I don't think they'll be uh, terribly influential in terms of putting together legislative coalitions or things like that. Um, you know, and the interesting question will be, yeah, this, this is going to be a Trumpy party moving forward. But interesting question is, what? how do you define Trumpy? I don't think anybody's looking at the last four years and saying, you know what House members, Republican House members need to do more of? Tweet about Joe Scarborough and the intern down in Florida. And, you know, crazy QAnon conspiracy theories. Okay, one or two House members will be going on about uh, QAnon conspiracy theories. Now, I'll tell you what it is. Skepticism? You know, you can see some, you know, that, that that's probably going to gain some ground. Uh, skepticism of military intervention, yeah, okay, I think that's going to gain some ground in, in Republican circles. Uh, I think one of the things that's really going to be interesting to see is you started seeing at, by election night people saying that the future of the Republican Party is a multi-ethnic working class party. And somebody tweeted that out and you got all kinds of likes and people are sharing it and it's clearly a very popular idea. And you saw some people, multi-ethnic working class party. I thought that was the Democrats. That was traditionally their brand for a really long time. But as the Democrats become, if not elitist, certainly you know, fund, you know, funded by billionaires with uh, like like Mike Bloomberg and catering to niche issue, gun control and uh, abortion, sing your abortion or whatever their slogan. Then all of a sudden, there's there's this vacuum of voters out there that are there for anybody who's willing to pitch to them. And I think one of the really interesting things will be: look, we have no idea what the world's going to look like four years from now. So it's kind of crazy to say, ah, the right Republican to run in 2024 would be this person. But assuming we, we are in a, let's say, non-pandemic circumstance like this, a Republican presidential candidate who said, my mission in life is to see wages go up, particularly people at the lowest income scale, that, that would resonate a lot with a lot of people who are not traditionally voting for Republicans. And as long as you do this not in a big government, heavy regulation kind of way, that's going to be you know, the, the traditional Republicans are, or, or would have really no objection to it. And you know what that kind of looks like? It's kind of Reagan-y. You know, the, 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 the Reagan, uh, there were a bunch of working class blue collar folks who saw Reagan as one of them. Now, he'd spent his life in Hollywood. He was not necessarily a guy who'd been on the, the uh, 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 you know, assembly line for lots of years, but his, his message resonated with them. That could work. I, now, whether this means Republicans tweak their mood on the minimum wage or some other issues like that, I don't know. Um, but I think it's safe to say that, yeah, there, there will be a non-Trumpism without the celebrity factor, without the occasional crazy factor, without the angry tweeting factor. Uh, that could be a very resonant message for the party moving forward. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Josh Hawley and, uh, and Molly Hemingway sort of sent out that we're now the multiracial, the Republicans are the multiracial uh, a working class party. And, and, and I don't think Donald Trump spent much time on assembly lines either. So it's... Uh, it's interesting to see how that will all uh, how that will all play out. Um, th before I move on to the next question, did anyone have anything that they wanted to add? Yeah, I would put it this way: I think it's easy to figure out. I mean, and he has plowed the path, and now someone else will will lead it. Uh, he be the party of the working class and not the rich. Again, look at the numbers, the money numbers, where they were in this race. Uh, right. Strong national defense, national security, very tough on trade. Um, and uh, a party of uh, traditional values and a party of faith. You want to see one group that showed up in this election. Ralph Reed's group showed up in this election. People of faith were big time in here uh, for Donald Trump. And, and I, I think if you track where the president's sympathies have gone over the last four years, where you've seen him 
um, give great uh, solace to people. I think it's been in those areas I cited. I think that's the path. I think it's a great path. And as somebody comes from an Irish working class family who likes Korean food, um, I, you know, I think that's just fine. You got you're yes. you're coming over to my house for Thanksgiving. Uh, two years <laughs> yeah. If you have power, if you have power. <laughs> yeah, I'm no. Uh, by uh, candlelight with you, John. Will. <laughs> while uh, while President Trump is certainly would never be accused of being the most devout uh, uh, person in the world, he certainly did a tremendous amount uh, yeah. for the cause of religious liberty and and Absolutely. you know the, the Ralph Reeds and and uh, of the world certainly were out in force not only during election but during the Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, fight that was interesting to observe. So, okay, so several there have been several mentions about about pollsters, uh, and they were another big loser, uh, obviously in this uh, election. Uh, I suppose a couple of exceptions, maybe the Trafalgar Group or something like that. Uh, they, they all of their expectations were upset. So, what lessons have we learned from that, and are are pollsters ever going to recover? Well, they well, didn't recover after 2016. Um, and I have to remember that uh, some of the national polls, we have we don't know what the popular vote total is right now. It takes a long time to count everything across the country. Um, but, you know, in 2016, the popular vote polls weren't that far off. Uh, they had Clinton ahead by a couple of points, uh, maybe three, and she won the popular vote by two. So. Uh, that wasn't, they, they really weren't that far off. They were terrible in the states. And this year, they were terrible in the states. The Washington Post poll published, I think, on the 28th of October, uh, its new poll of Wisconsin, which had um, uh, Biden leading Trump by 17 points, 57 to 40. I mean, that was insane. It was absolutely insane. And, and people in Wisconsin were saying, this is crazy. Uh, but there were a lot of other polls that showed 7, 8, 9, 10, points uh, a Biden lead. And the, and the same was true in some of these other states. And since we do have an electoral college system, these state polls um, um, are so important in the final days of the campaign. And they were all terrible. And, and I, I know that everybody I talk to, all the Republicans I talked to on the campaign trail, and I'm talking voters, uh, just rank and file voters, I mean, none of them trusted any of the polls. They didn't believe anything. In part, they, they associated any pollster with the media. So, I mean, most pollsters are doing a poll for some media organization, some are not. Uh, but anytime they heard about a pollster, they saw CNN. I mean, I had people uh, say, you don't work for CNN, do you? Uh, and I said, no, no. <laughs> um, but, uh, sorry, Bill. But um, but the, the, the distrust of pollsters was unbelievable. And I, I began to believe uh, that, you know, there was uh, a hidden Trump vote. Uh, they didn't like the president. They didn't like the word shy Trump voters. But uh, I talked with with uh, Republican pollsters who were working for, let's say, um, pro-Trump groups. They weren't for the campaign. Uh, and they had done a lot of polling on this. And they, they believed it was anywhere from two and a half to three points uh, anywhere. And it seems to have been even worse in some cases uh, or even more more important in some cases. So the crisis is with these state level polls that are all apparently garbage. Jim, did you, you know, want to weigh in? Sure. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Robert Kahali, who's the head of Trafalgar Group Polling, did an interview with my boss, Rich Lowry, and it was a terrific interview. And I'm not just saying that because it was done by my boss. Um, Kahali had said that he'd only ask just a couple of questions. And he thinks one of the issues is if you're a pollster and you're calling people, very often you're calling in the early evening hours, it's dinner time. You got somebody who's trying to put the kids, get the kids fed, get the kid, help the kids with their homework, get the kids to bed. Um, and some of these pollsters that aren't the Trafalgar group have 20 to 30 questions. So answering all of them can take quite some time. And his thinking is that you just, you know, end up excluding a big chunk of the electorate who just doesn't have time, who, who just isn't interested in it, to say nothing, all the issues with caller ID and people who are cell phone on, only and things like that. Pollsters can generally try to adjust for that. I mean, generally what you do is you just call a lot more people <clears throat> until you get the number of responses you want. And the demographics of who's responded are akin to what you're looking for, for a realistic projection of who's going to be there on election day. Um, the, the, you know, I think the, the, the Robert Cahali theory is that there's a chunk of voters out there 
who are just never going to answer the phone, who are just not interested in doing this, to say nothing of the possibility of they're voting for Trump, but they don't want anybody to know. They know it's kind of socially uh, looked down upon in their circles. Um, and the other thing is Patrick Graffini, another very smart guy who works on the Republican side, made the observation that we're going to have, what is it, like 140 million people vote in this election? Yeah. Let's assume that the people who answer the phone are political junkies. And they're, they're out there. They're just, you know, let's say 20 to 30 million Americans are diehard political junkies, where if somebody calls up and asks, what do you think about politics? They will talk for a half hour or more about what they think, right? Well, there's like 100 million Americans who aren't in that group and who are much less likely. So maybe you can measure politically uh, tuned in, impassioned Americans very easily. Once the electorate expands out to be a much bigger group, it's a lot harder to measure that accurately. And particularly getting the measurement of that last 50 million Americans who are last to decide and least certain to vote and decide, oh, it's not raining on Tuesday, I guess I'll go vote. Maybe those are the folks who are always gonna be toughest to uh, measure and their votes count, count just like everybody else's and they could end up being decisive, particularly in a bunch of these close races. This, uh, putting down pollsters is right, and uh, everybody's doing it, but I would still like to hear a report as soon as someone knows of, of any of these prominent pollsters being fired. When that happens, send me a, send me an email, would you? But I'm not worried about them. They can go where they belong, and we all know where they belong. They can get on the tenure track at the universities. That's where they should be anyway in the sociology department and so on. But what's going to happen to the poor never-Trumpers? Uh, a lot of whom I know well, many of the most prominent used to work for me. Where do they go? They can't go to the university. I mean, if I'm thinking of several of these people, I don't know them, you know them by name, go and they say, we used to work for Bill Bennett. You are canceled. So, I mean, none of the pollsters ever have, as far as I know. But um, I would like to see, I would just wonder whether any of these big polling outfits or people actually get a, get a uh, you know, get a dismissal. Will they? Or will they get a promotion? Because of trying hard there's, who was, there's two who was it who said about 2016 and then 2020 the first time is a mistake the second time is a choice and that's that's what that's what happened here the first thing is there's always an audience for people who want to see poll results that tell them what they want to hear <laughs> so right. the first thing is that if you're you know lo and behold our first poll says the biden administration has 97 approval rating you know yeah, job right. approval there are first of all there are media organizations who will love to tout that and you know uh, Right. Uh, public policy polling has been a democratic firm that somehow somehow when you see quotes about public policy polling they always seem to forget that it's a, a democratic firm you know they, they, look look back in the newspaper articles how often that gets cited yeah. um, but just beyond that you know, one of the things that's frustrating about this whether whether or not you believe the pollsters are out to depress republicans or fire up democrats or something like that i'd really like to know what the public thinks and not just in november's every two years I'd really like to know what they think about certain certain topics. And so it's one of those things where if I, and I'd like to get a sense of what the whole electorate thinks, not just the people who are bored on a Tuesday night and want to you know, uh, talk to a pollster or press buttons on their phone for half an hour or something like that. I, I'd like to have it. It may be that, that just the trends of human psychology and society and people, um, people just aren't as interested. They have more going on in their lives now than they did say a couple decades ago where somebody from Zogby or Rasmussen, which, oh, by the way, Rasmussen is no longer Scott Rasmussen, um, or one of these other organizations, they're just like, I've got, I've got Netflix. I don't need to answer the phone anymore. I don't need to tell you what I think of, you know, strongly support, moderately support, moderately disagree, or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, a, a number so, of people I've talked to, one last thing about these big polls, about a poll like the, the Post showing a 17-point lead in, in Wisconsin, um, a, a lot of Republicans felt that it was not just a wrong poll, but it seemed almost designed to discourage Republican voters wherever right. they were. And there was, of course, overall in the media, uh, this this sense of the coverage that you know surround you know you're surrounded, give yourself up, you know you have no hope. Um, and that's why it was so uh, extraordinary and refreshing to spend time among voters out there who were really really fired up, uh, but who basically had created networks among themselves on Facebook uh, in which they shared the, the information they wanted to share and they, they didn't talk about uh, the latest uh, Washington Post op-ed, uh, although they would talk about the poll perhaps to dump on it and, and view it as, a, as an opposition measure. But um, the degree of distrust is such that they felt that polls were not only wrong, but that they had a, had a purpose which was to discourage them from voting. 
yeah, if they if they put out anything on Twitter, they might get one of those false banners or something, yeah. uh, something, <laughs> something like that. So we've also made several references during this discussion about about money uh, in that race, and and as, as has been alluded to, they spent staggering sums of money. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in terms of trying to beat Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham, John Cornyn, Susan Collins, uh, Roger Marshall, and Joni Ernst. Uh, none of those worked. Graham said. Uh, in his victory speech, this is a quote, to all the pollsters out there, you have no idea what you're doing. And to all the liberals in California and New York, you wasted a lot of money. So, you know, money obviously did not translate into winning. So what lessons should we take away from all that? You know, the, the big, one of the biggest advantages the Republican Party has is that the Democratic grassroots, certainly in the Trump era, and you can probably even go back to most of the Obama era, uh, most of the days of uh, the late o late Bush administration, Shimpy Bush, Hitler, Halliburton, all that kind of stuff. The Democratic grassroots are generous, and they are angry, and they are stupid because they keep putting their money in races that they, they really have no shot at winning. And you're going to look at that, you're like, you know, you know, maybe, uh, you know, actually, in the end, Gideon wasn't all that close either. But, you know, maybe um, Iowa would have been a closer race. You know, we're, we're coming down to the wire in North Carolina. Uh, maybe Cal Cunningham, with his extensive, extensive outreach to women, was a better out, better shot to uh, to spend all that money. Um, you know, like, you're, you're not going to knock off Mitch McConnell. You do this every six years, and it doesn't work. You're probably not going to knock off Susan Collins. Susan Collins retires. You have a good chance of picking up that open seat. You know, Maine's kind of a quirky, it's purple, but mostly blue. But Collins, you know, Collins is the the nicest, most polite, least partisan, pleasant, you know, senator in the world. And she sits atop a throne of skulls of her enemy. You know, um, but yeah, every six years they come <laughs> after her. And lo and behold, on election day, she wins by a ton. She won her state when in 2008, when Barack Obama was beating John McCain like a drum in her state, right? This is not, you know, Democrats walk into almost all of these thinking it's going to be easy. And I think a part of this comes from donors in California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Connecticut, all that, who don't know what it's like in Maine and don't realize Collins is pretty well situated. Think about it. Susan Collins voted for uh, Brett Kavanaugh and against only Amy Coney Barrett and just won by nine, right? Everybody in the state should be pissed at her. And they're not. And I think it's just because she's got a really good record and she knows where the pulse of her state is. Lindsey Graham, like the fact that you in California hate Lindsey Graham doesn't mean that South Carolinians hate Lindsey Graham. The fact that you in New York hate Mitch McConnell doesn't mean Kentucky voters hate Mitch McConnell. And they just don't, it, it cycle after cycle. If they ever wised up, the Republican Party would be in deep trouble. But at this point, they're not. And the, uh, one of the things I'm going to kind of, you know, I went back and I collected all of these Beto O'Rourke profiles from 2018. He skateboards. He was in a band. Look at these pictures of him with his sleeves rolled up. Doesn't he look cool? And none of that was like, this is the kind of guy who's going to win Texas. And then he looked a little bit deeper and is like, he wants to ban AR-15s. This is not a natural fit. He wants to impeach the president. This is not a natural fit with the state of Texas. And there are these natural political reporters who just like they they like stars in their eyes and little hearts around their circles like a peanuts cartoon and they look at Bitto or work and they write four paragraphs about him sweating and how fantastic he is and my suspicion is like this gets out to the democratic grassroots and they say wow this guy really has a shot and i hate to, uh, ted cruz i'm going to write him a check right now let me get out to act blue let me send him the money this very second and lo and behold it doesn't work so thank goodness for that otherwise republicans would really be in trouble <laughs> you gonna write a book about Beto O'Rourke uh, before he yeah, turns so. all together? Tell us everything you know. Tell us everything you know. Want something, right? <laughs> Again. All right. Let's 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 move on to another uh, another topic. So so obviously with this election, maybe it's just going to be pandemic related. Maybe not. But we had a very unprecedented use of vote by mail. Uh, this was you know quite controversial among conservatives who believe. Uh, that mail-in balloting at least increases the potential uh, uh, for fraud, and and some of that, some of those those fears and concerns may be uh, playing themselves out in various lawsuits that have now been uh, been filed. What does the future of voting look like in this country? 
you know, I um, don't like mail-in balloting, and I think there ought to be less of it. Um, but I was talking to a Republican uh, strategist, again, very pro-Trump, um, who thought if he made a mistake this year, it was not going all in on mail-in balloting and in, instead um, denouncing it, criticizing it, saying it's all fraud, and urging his voters to vote on election day. Um, and by by doing that, it, Democrats, obviously they pushed it because they thought it would, would be to their advantage, and it was. Um, but, you know, they were banking hundreds of thousands of votes every day on Tuesday and then Wednesday and Thursday and through the weekend, they were banking votes. And Trump was denouncing mail-in balloting and telling everybody, we're going to really turn out on election day, um, which always subjects you to the vagaries, the unpredictable parts of life like weather and other things about election day. Uh, and besides, it just makes makes uh, for a very imbalanced sort of situation. So uh, uh, I, I think uh, as, as Trump looks back um, and looks at his discouraging uh, mail-in balloting, um, he will probably uh, regret that because the states were going to do what they were going to do. Uh, if they were going to go to mail-in balloting in a big, big way, they were going to do that. The president couldn't stop them from doing that. And since that was the reality on the ground, uh, I think Trump would have been uh, better off to say, we don't like this mail-in balloting, but that's what it is, and you guys got to vote now. Uh, and he could have been banking votes every day like they were instead of waiting for this big, dramatic election day turnout. Um, John, I, I, just a comment. Yeah. I think um, this is a, a good question about how much of our lives are going to be uh, permanently changed by the pandemic, or are these going to be looked back and we'll say they were emergency measures that are no longer necessary? Um, one problem with mail-in balloting is that it reduces the information available to the voter. So if you're doing mail-in ballots three weeks ago, two weeks ago, you know the October surprise of Hunter Biden made no difference to your right. vote. Uh, so I would, I think uh, maybe the constitutional mechanism is important to remember, and it, it may uh, raise another issue worth talking about, which is this is, again, an area where the state legislatures set the rules. And so I think you're going to have postmortems, and I think you'll see a number of states go back to encouraging people to vote in person like Pennsylvania used to. And uh, one thing I think uh, maybe is a story I was really interested in that uh, didn't get a lot of attention was control of the state legislatures, which is all important this election because this is an election where uh, we do the census and then there's going to be redistricting. And from what I've been seeing in the election results is that uh, Democrats who did try to try to change control over state houses and spent a lot of money on that too, in addition, probably part of the trillion, whatever the billions that uh, Bill was talking about, I think they didn't flip control of a single one, which is incredible. Right. I mean, consider what like Trump won four stuff. years ago. Yeah, yeah Republicans did flip stuff. Well, yeah. I think Trump, the, the Republicans won thousand, you know, won something like a thousand state house seats in that election right. and uh, gained the control over a number of state houses. And so I don't know. I, I think that's another reflection of how this election wasn't really a rejection of the Republican Party and its principles when you start going down and looking at the state elections. Could I ask John you a question, John Malcolm? Uh, and that is, um, do you think that mail-in balloting, apart from being providing less information, thinking about that oil and gas worker who missed the last debate because they'd already voted, right? But um, is it intrinsically more uh, liable uh, to uh, fraud than in-person voting? Is there something about the nature of it that makes it so? And before you answer that, John, you bring it up, brought up COVID. I was surprised if this is accurate information that I read the others can, can tell me, that COVID was not the number one issue. The number one issue, according to voters, was the economy. And right. second was health care. COVID was third. Um, and you, if, if you listen to some of those other uh, stations, I, I refer to other, other stations, uh, if you listen to CNN, if you listen to MSNBC, you would think that COVID was as overwhelming uh, a choice of the number one issue as it was the overwhelming uh, nature of the disease, as they reported it. But John, is there something uh, intrinsic to, to the mail-in ballot as opposed to the in-person ballot that makes it more susceptible to fraud? 
I have an answer to that, but so go ahead. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. No, please. Hey, either I, John. I, 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 I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, for instance, so in Washington, D.C., where I live, they just automatically sent you a ballot whether you ask for one or, or not. Uh, and you ha end up having uh, you know, people requesting mail-in ballots at, uh, at, at post office, uh, you know, in, 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 in I'm sorry, commercial uh, uh, buildings. Uh, you end up having ballots sent in for people who have either died or have moved away a long time ago. Uh, and who knows what is, uh, who is okay. grabbing those ballots and who is filling out those ballots. And so the potential is certainly there. You were sent one on, and you're unasked for, and I'm wondering, was it already filled in, I'm wondering? <laughs> but that they used to do that in the 19th century. But yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, if you go to a polling place, you know, then then you have somebody there to make sure you are not being intimidated when you are yeah. filling out your ballot. Yeah, yeah. That is Fair not, enough. those safeguards are not there with a mail in ballot. I mean, I have to say, I think the studies show low rates for both. And so, but we don't know because... I mean, this is going to be an amazing social science experiment, if you think about it, because there was such an enormous change between four years ago and today. I mean, look at Pennsylvania. You have two orders of magnitude higher which uh, of mail and back. So I don't think those studies that we've seen in the past, these are usually very tiny numbers. Right. We we just don't, I don't think we really know. We'll know maybe in a year or two when we can go and look back. Right. So so during the campaign, you know, we obviously heard a lot about the Green New Deal, defunding the police single payer health care, banning fracking and the like. Uh, you know, Joe Biden uh, denied that he was in favor of these things, but if he wins, and let's assume for the moment that he wins, he's gonna face a lot of pressure from his progressive base to push this agenda. Now, it'll be tougher for them to get anything through legislatively, but you know, is the pragmatist Joe Biden gonna win or is the, you know, the, the progressive base gonna win? Can, we, can we expect to see a lot more very progressive presidential executive orders. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think uh, actually Joe Biden might in uh, four years from now or two years from now be thanking his mighty stars that the Republicans kept the Senate. Because uh, I think we mentioned before, think of all the things that were on the progressive agenda that uh, cocaine Mitch is not gonna allow through the body, right? They're not gonna get rid of the filibuster. They're not gonna pack the Supreme Court. They're not gonna do the Green New Deal. So. Uh, if anything, this this Senate is going to already push Biden into moderation, whether he likes it or not. In fact, it might give him more authority within his own party to beat back, you know, the Bernie Sanders types. But I, I think it, there is a difference between legislation and regulation. Uh, and uh, the president can do a lot in two areas without the Senate, and that's uh, issuing regulations in areas that Congress is right, delegate powers and in the environmental area in particular, the president has sweeping powers to do things which will have a real impact on the economy. And then the other area is foreign affairs, which we haven't talked about, but that's another area where um, you could see uh, a huge change in what the president does on his own, uh, even though the Republicans keep the Senate. You could see Joe Biden, I think, for example, um, re-entering the Iran nuclear deal. You could see him re-entering the Paris Accords, which we just left. <laughs> he could right. re-sign that. I mean, you could China. see him trying to reach an accommodation with China. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could see a, you know re a restoration of the Obama foreign policy, and he doesn't. He, that's even more powerful, I think, than the unilateral power of regulations. I just one last thing is on the regulations. The interesting thing is, if you look at the Supreme Court's DACA opinion, which I thought was wrong, but it made it really hard and slow to undo the last president's policy. So. Yes, Biden could start issuing those regulations, but it's going to take him a year or even two before they really start coming into effect. I was just going to say that uh, there's a report in Axios this morning that uh, Mitch McConnell has already kind of sent a signal to the Biden team that, you know, your centrist guy, the options, you know, Chris Coons, the Delaware senator, Tom Donilon, uh, guys like that, they could get through pretty easily. But if you try to get through Stacey Abrams as attorney general, uh, Elizabeth Warren as Treasury Secretary, Bernie Sanders wanting to run the Department of Labor, you're going to have a tough confirmation fight. And, you know, there are some people I, I heard from people who's like, oh, why are, wait, why would you help Biden like that? Let's put all the nut jobs in the administration. Let's, it's, let's create that backlash. And I don't know about you guys, if, if we can keep, given a choice between a less frustrating, tolerable Democrat or the nut jobs, give me the tolerable Democrat, because we're, we're still climbing out of the economic wreckage of the pandemic. I don't want Elizabeth Warren declaring war on Wall Street on Wall Street and making economic policy a hash 
in this administration. If we can get the centrists in there, this could be, you know, not that bad. I have a feeling that after the absolute, you know, battering ram contentiousness, Joe Biden's been saying, look, I'm a return to normalcy. I'm, I'm ending the drama. I'm ending all of it. It's time for us to unite. He was quoting Abraham Lincoln. You know, if he puts up the not so crazy types and doesn't, you know, if, if he goes out and he tries to do the exec, all these big changes by executive order, then he's just restarting the fire all over again. You're going to have the exact same situation. And you're going to have the exact same fights. So I, I wouldn't gonna, count on it. I wouldn't bet the mortgage, but I think there'll be, there'll be, you know, I think Biden's instincts are not to be uh, in line with AOC and Bernie Sanders and all these types. I think his gut instinct is a backroom back slapping, how you doing? And, you know, the other thing is that Mitch McConnell now gives him the very convenient excuse. Every time Democrats want him to push for some legislation, they'll even say, come on, man, there's no way I can get that through the Senate. I want to. I'll, I'll ask a question. We're nearing the end of our time. But I'll ask a question about about uh, cabinet members. I'll, I'll ask you, but I have another question before that. The question I'm going to ask you about the cabinet members or who you might see in a Biden cabinet, and if uh, the president pulls it out and and wins, President Trump, whether there would be any reshuffling within his own cabinet. But my my question I want to ask at the moment is if if Joe Biden wins the presidency. What is going to happen with the probe that is being done by the Connecticut U.S. Attorney John Durham and the FBI's reported ongoing investigation about Hunter uh, Biden? And then connected to that, in either a Biden administration or a second Trump term, does Chris Ray keep his job? Well, I think uh, on the Durham investigation, a, a lot of us thought that there would be some sort of uh, report out by Labor Day. Well, that just didn't happen. Uh, didn't happen with the, uh, with, the, with the election either. So um, is there even a Durham report? Is it in pieces? Will it be released? I think, the, uh, I think we can be absolutely certain that the administration will release the major findings of Durham in some form before, if, if President Trump loses, in some form before January 20th of next year. I just, it's going to come out and it needs to come out. I think that's, um, it's important for it to come out. As far as Hunter Biden is concerned, I don't think any of us knows what, if anything, uh, the authorities are actually doing as far as he is concerned. Uh, the, the one thing we do know uh, is that uh, the, the media tried to just absolutely extinguish this story um, when it came out in the final weeks of the election. And I think one thing that's slightly interesting is a media story, since since there are these clear issues, and, and Hunter Biden just seems to be without a doubt uh, a, a blackmail target uh, at, at the very least, uh, since there are a lot of issues that have been raised, um, will some member of the mainstream media decide that well, maybe we ought to look into this story just a little bit? I know we said it wasn't a story, and but you know that was before November 3rd and now is after November 3rd. So I, I actually look for somebody uh, out there to start actually looking into it again. I think Mr. that- Mr. Uh, his job in a Biden or Trump administration? I'm sorry, what was that? Does Chris Ray keep his job as FBI director oh. under President Biden or President Trump? Yeah, I actually, um, uh, well, d d depending on what the FBI is doing in the Hunter Biden situation, if anything, uh, yeah, I think he actually would keep his job. I just want to remind that uh, uh, Vice President Biden, when he was in the Senate, was a big supporter of the independent counsel. Loved the idea of, ha in fact, uh, and some in his wing of the party wanted to pass a new statute if they won to create, you know, recreate the independent counsel. So I would think there's going to be a lot of pressure, given that the Republicans keep the Senate and they can have their own investigation of Hunter Biden as well. There's going to be a lot of pressure to appoint a special counsel for an investigation. Uh, they, I am sure they're investigating it now. When we uh, at the Justice Department uh, investigate Americans for trying to bribe foreign leaders under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, we investigate and bring charges against people for doing exactly what the Chinese did with Hunter Biden. Oh, just hire the president's son over there in that country. That is defined as corruption in our own cases. So. Uh, I think they're going to be looking around for former or current Justice Department officials to lead an investigation uh, to enter Hunter Biden. And you know, you'll see President Biden say, "We'll give him independence," and, or her independence. 
So, John, I think you're not doing anything next year. I think you ought to volunteer for this job. You'd be a perfect <laughs> independent counsel for the Biden yeah. investigation. <laughs> go ahead and suggest me, John. Uh, so let me ask a, a last question, I, and, and we can go around the horn. Uh, and, and feel free when I when I get to you to offer any closing thoughts that you might have about who you th think we might see in a in a, a Biden cabinet, or if there would be any reshuffling in a second Trump term if President Trump uh, uh, pulls it out. And then you know feel free to offer any 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 closing thoughts. Who wants to go first? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> I, I walked through it. Mentioned a few names earlier. Um, if Biden does go in this direction, you'd see somebody like Donilon or uh, uh, Chris Coons as uh, Secretary of State, who's the other Delaware senator. There's a long tradition of, you know, uh, kind of, uh, it's easier to get one of the Senate to get one of their own confirmed. Um, and the other thing, which is one other factor working against Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, is that uh, the, there's a Republican governor of Massachusetts and Charlie Baker, there's a Republican governor, Scott, in Vermont. Republican, they'd be presumably appointing the replacements and they could appoint a Republican. Uh, although I think there's some Massachusetts legislator, they can sacrifice the entrails of a goat and prevent it. There's something fancy <laughs> legislative, but the gist is that gives Biden one, if, particularly if it's 50 50, which it looks like it's going to be, that's one more easy way for Joe Biden to let him down to say, look, Elizabeth, I'd love to put you at Treasury, but I can't, you know, okay, that's not. Um, look, if you're the Biden administration, I, I guess a big question is, how much do you want to have these fights over your cabinet? Personnel is, is, is policy. And, and if you think that Stacey Abrams is the best option to be uh, the next attorney general, then yeah, I guess you can have that fight. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Doug Jones is a former U.S. attorney. He's looking for a job. And most Republicans probably would look at all the options for an attorney general in a Biden administration to go, eh, OK, it's not Yates. It's not some somebody like Abrams. Fine. Let's go with him. Um, so, you know, you could see, I, I think the Biden administration, they're going to want to do a big coronavirus bill. They're going to want to do a big stimulus bill. You want to get onto the big meaty legislative fights. I don't know how much time you want to get into these, these, but I don't know if the difference between Susan Rice, the secretary of state versus Donilon or Chris Coons is worth having this giant knockdown fight or, or something like that. And as for my wrap up thoughts, you know, Republicans, you know, conservatives, this didn't go that bad. This could have been a heck of a lot worse. It's, it's not, you know, if Trump does not come out in the presidential election, it's not the way we wanted, but he did not get blown out. A whole bunch of states that we, you know, eked out a win in in 2016 are still reasonably close. Uh, we're probably going to have a big, messy battle in uh, in 2024. I don't think Trump will do a Grover Cleveland and try to run for a second term, but you never know. Um, but, you know, the, the, the chart of being a more populist but still conservative party looks like it could win and all in all we got the house or, or we're gaining in the house it could be very close we've got the senate did very well in the state legislatures uh redistricting looks like it's going to be okay we got six supreme court justices the, 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 if this is the bottom this is really good to be the bottom and you know we're back on defense again Wants to go next i think that uh if trump uh, were to stay in office i don't think you'd see a lot of change in the the biggest departments i think you'd see Barr stay at the justice department pompeo stay at state mnuchin stay at treasury there would be probably maybe a change at defense i'm not sure uh but not a not a huge amount of uh of of, of turnover um but uh, you know i think that um the the big picture is um this presidency accomplished an extraordinary number of things uh and i think that trump was clearly the most successful Republican president since Reagan, um, not only in tax cuts and judicial confirmations and in military um, rebuilding, um, uh, getting rid of, of, of regulations, uh, just an enormous number of areas, uh, destroying ISIS, uh, killing some really bad people like Soleimani and others. Um, I think it was a very consequential uh, and productive administration. I understand there was a daily hair on fire controversy that began as a daily matter in 2015 when Trump first uh, started about talking about running, uh, and that consumed so much everyday coverage of it. But but uh, if it in fact is over, uh, and you look back at what has been accomplished, 
uh, from a Republican point of view, it's an extraordinarily productive presidency. John, Bill? Yeah, just real quickly on the cabinet reshuffle issue. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're a historian 10, 20 years from now, and you look back at this, are we going to look at it and say this was a Trump interregnum in between, you know, four years of two, two terms of Obama and then essentially Obama three? Is this going to be the third Obama term? Are you going to see a return of all those people who Obama kept in office or that Hillary was going to have nominated? And uh, or is it going to be something really different? Is it going to be like Jim and Byron saying where we're going to see more compromise out of a moderate from, by uh, Biden with a Republican Senate than you would have seen with Obama? Hillary would have probably been much more confrontational, uh, probably more ideological. Um, my my guess is uh, given the way the campaign worked and given the, the, this my sense of this is my wrap up to the Biden kind of seems like an empty vessel in the way that he doesn't really seem to have core principles. He just seems like a weather vane to me about what the Democratic Party basically, uh, you know, is thinking in that at that point in time. I, I think it's going to be like Obama three. I think you're just going to see a return of all the old faces that we had seen for eight years rather than uh, completely new people. Uh, and, uh, you know, that didn't really work towards the end of the Obama administration. I think they were kind of exhausted intellectually and ideologically. And so you might see them return, but I don't think you're going to see really any fresh agenda. Bill, any thoughts? Uh, two things. Just let me repeat. I, I agree with Byron. I think this was a very successful presidency. Maybe there'll be a, another one right after, um, maybe if he's reelected. But um, again, I think he showed the path. Party of the working class. By the way, Biden used to say, you know, I'm from Scranton, they're from Wall Street. I think the votes in Scranton were for Trump and the votes in Wall Street were for Biden. I think that's reversed. These guys can correct me. But party of the working class, tough on trade, strong on national security and defense, uh, a party of traditional values and faith. Uh, and um, if I might add, maybe fiscal responsibility some someday, somewhere, somewhere. Oh, not oh, Byron's shaking his head. Garrett, he's <laughs> laughing. Uh, the last, maybe not. Okay, let me wait. The last thing I'd say is in terms of cabinet, John, uh, you and I uh, uh, both share uh, one thing for sure. We were both in administrations criticized for our own actions uh, and the actions of the people we served. And I, I keep coming back to the to the fate, not of Chris Ray, but the fra fate of uh, Michael Flynn. Uh, I hope uh, if the president is not reelected that he will pardon him. Uh, this guy has been treated miserably, horribly. He has been the Job uh, of the last year, bounced around between these courts. So I hope he is uh, released from his pain or reinstalled as a national security advisor. Well, with that, I want to thank all the people uh, who listened in uh, today. I hope you enjoyed the program. I want to, uh, of course, thank my four panelists. Uh, you guys did, uh, as I fully expected, an outstanding job. And with that, we are adjourned.